I decided to go swimming with the kids yesterday morning. So about 10 o'clock, I jumped in 1030. I jump in the pool with them. And my wife says to me before I get out there, because we're trying to teach Emily to swim without her floaties. She says, you get in the pool with them, Steve, and will you help Emily swim? And so every once in a while, I'll do that. I'll take her and I'll, I'll hold her up. She's only four years old, you know, and we're making sure that she swims early. Thanks, guys. And so I want her to swim early. And, and so I get her in the pool. And I take her swimming. So I said, we're going to learn to swim a little bit. She's all nervous. I said, Daddy won't let go of you. Daddy will hold you. So I got Stephen across from me in the pool. And I, I, I said, I'm going to shove you over there. And you swim to Stephen, okay? So I, keep playing. I liked it. So she, so... <laughs> So, so I shove her across the pool, and she's flailing away, and she goes under, you know, and comes back up, and she's fine, you know. But, I mean, she, she, she's crying a little bit and frustrated, and then Stephen throws her back to me, and I'm going to do it again, and I throw her out there, and I'm holding her. And she stops and looks, and she says, Dad! I said, what? She said, I want to turn five. <laughs> oh, is that great or what? I, Dad, I want to turn five. Would you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 15, starting at the 21st verse. Matthew 15, starting at the 21st verse. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered not a word. He answered not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away. She cries after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said to her, and I love these words. I want you to think of these words. When you hear these, this is a defining characteristic of this lady. I don't know her name. We're never going to know her name. We'll never be privileged to know where she came from, her history, her background. We don't know anything but these four words. But this lady becomes one of the greatest characters in the Bible. And, in, in, and from my perspective, one of the greatest ladies on the planet because of what Jesus sees in her. It's what Jesus examines in her, the experience that she gives him here. Because he's a student of faith. You know Jesus never once commented of his own disciples this way? Not one time did he use this, this phrase to indicate what they were or who they were. But yet, here's this lady in the Bible. And you have to realize that the Bible is a man book. You may not believe that, but it was, it was a male-dominated society. Sociocultural experience was a male domination. Women were kind of relegated to a place of, of, uh, of less than. We hear about the men. They count them. They don't count the women. I mean, it's a male-dominated book, so women were always, because of society and because of the cultures of the time, they were not you know, mentioned name-wise, but he gives us an indication of the greatness of this lady because he says, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now, you know I'm a faith man, and I see a lot of things in the scriptures relating to faith. One of the things that I know about faith, ladies, is this, that faith always has a corresponding action. Faith will always have corresponding action. Faith cannot be justified in nebulous thought. It, it, faith is not expressed in, in, in just words that we say or that we know or thoughts that we have. Faith is expressed in the doing of our life. It's what we do that tells us whether or not faith is present or absent. It's the, it's the it, literally, I love one great man of God, Smith Wigglesworth, said this, faith is an act. Look at somebody and say, faith is an act. Faith is an act. So our faith is expressed in our corresponding actions. It's what we do that, we, that expresses faith, really tells what doing is the expression of faith. Faith is an act. And Jesus designates this woman as a great woman because of her faith. See, she insisted on and went through uh, embarrassments, indignities, 
Jesus himself didn't even express, didn't talk to her when she spoke. And yet, even in the midst of intimidation by the disciples, she pressed in and, and shows us that faith will reap a harvest. Because look, it says, and her daughter was made whole from that very hour. By her expression, by what she did, by the actions of her life, she has now seen her daughter heal. And you know, Jesus is clear in most of these scriptures. And when we look at Jesus, only one time can we see where Jesus had healed somebody and did not somehow indicate that it was their faith that made them whole. I know we want to believe it was his power and his faith. Yes, we know he had the power, but it was not his power alone that allowed people to get healed. They were healed because of their faith. My faith is proved out in what I do. You see, I can tell, I can look at people's uh, walk with God. I can, I, not that I would judge anybody. We don't need to judge anybody. I ever need to judge anybody. Because God doesn't give us the right to judge. And I don't know when somebody gets saved or don't get saved. I, I don't know about death spread salvations and falling out of airplanes and whether or not you cried out on Jesus. I don't know. So I don't ever go there. But if you're living a life and, and God says don't, don't, don't live uh, you know, with somebody you're not married to and have sex with them, that's called adultery or it's called fornication. And you're doing that, your, your walk with Jesus is suspect. <laughs> if my faith is demonstrated in my actions, if what I do demonstrates my faith, you can run around claiming Jesus all day long, talking about Jesus all day long, and have all the jargon you want. But if you're walking around uh, in sin claiming Jesus, your actions deflate your, your words. I mean, no, there's an old saying, your actions speak so loud, I can't hear a word you're saying. Look at somebody and say that. Hey, you know what? Find somebody. Look them right in the face. Hey, you know what? Your actions speak so loud, I can't hear a word you're saying. Your actions depict and verify are the validity. That's why I think church is important. I think coming to church is a demonstration of my faith. I love God. I don't have to love the preacher. You should. After all, I'm such a loving guy and lovable and good looking at that. You know, I mean, no, I, I don't go to church ultimately because of the way he looks or the way he dresses or even his attitude. Now, if he was living in sin, I wouldn't go to that church, you know. But I mean, ultimately, if there's integrity in the pulpit and all those things, and you, you don't have to like my sermon every week. Every week doesn't have to be for you. Did you know not every week you come to church is for you? I mean, I know you come expecting every week, but sometimes God brings you for somebody else's expectation. You're there to help provide for somebody else. You know, my tithe doesn't always provide for me in that specific way. Sometimes giving to God will be provided for me by God later, but in that specific moment, it provides for other people to have air conditioning. You don't always have to think about you and how you're going to be blessed. Somebody say Amen. But you know, coming to church ought to be a thing that we do. It ought to be something that we, that we want to do. Why? Well, because of my faith. My faith stimulates me to live for God. My faith stimulates me to walk like God. My faith stimulates me. My actions are the result of my faith. And if my, if my actions don't line up with my faith, then my actions dictate what my faith really is. Amen. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? I try to get here a little more often. I'm just suggesting it, I mean, because I really feel like I got something from God for you this morning. So we can see that her actions, even though intimidated, even though discouraging, brought her a material victory. Her child lived a blessing from God. I want you to look with me to Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Talking about women today. I feel like that I have shaped my kids in some areas. I, I do feel that way. I mean, a husband shapes his children. I have noticed, however, that my shaping tends to line up with where my wife is. Did anybody get that? 
that how I shape the kids has a lot to do with how she has shaped me. And my willingness to be shaped. I think the greatest natural resource and education in a home, this is just my thinking, I think we can lean back on mom. I really do. I think mom, not that you have the greatest responsibility, but you certainly, in my opinion, have the greatest influence in the home. How many would disagree? Anyone want to disagree? Now, I mean, I'm talking specifically of mom and dad homes where a mom and a dad are both in the house. If a mom's by herself or a dad's by himself, those things that kind of negate things are a little different today. But I think that moms ultimately tend to be a greater influence. Even the effects of negative things that happen with mom tend to be worse. I remember more things my mom said to me than my dad did. Does anybody have that same? I was standing at the iron board one time. And I asked my mother, I said, Mom, am I good looking? Every son wants to know. And she said, hey, son, you're no Robert Redford. <laughs> that had two good things to it. One is I realized where I fit in this life. The other one is that really hurt. <laughs> then things stand out. How many know what I'm talking about? Have you got those moments? Do you have those moments? And so the training of a mom, the, the training of, the, of a mother... And the influence of a mother in a house, I think, has, the, has some huge weight. I don't want to say the greatest. I could say it, but I believe it's the massive weight of a house. And I love that because to whom much is given, moms, you ought to be proud that God chose you. You ought to be excited that God is going to use you in your house like none other. Hey, I watched the NFL draft this week. I, I mean, it was a lot most, and, and Buffalo is going to kill everybody this year. Mm, and Sammy Watkins is going to be awesome. Come on, you Clemson fans. Let me hear it. Clemson North. That's what I'm calling it. Clemson North. <clears throat> I may have to switch from South Carolina to Clemson now, you know? I'm going to do I didn't see a bunch of dads, but I did see a bunch of moms. Did y'all see that? Every guy was walking his mom up the red carpet. For every man that's been out there coaching their kid all those years and your wife's sitting there on the sidelines, I'm going to go shopping. Can you get me when I'm done? Come on now. Any, any man know what I'm talking about? And you're over there talking and all this, and we're running around on the field. <laughs> And then when it comes time for draft, I'm sitting in the car. She's walking down the red carpet. What's up with that? And every one of y'all know it's true. It's always love you, mom. Hi, mom. What am I? I'm just a backseat driver and didn't know it. That's what it is. And so you have this massive responsibility. Those of you with little babies, we're coming forward with this responsibility. What do we have to teach our children? What is it that they have to see from us? Where are some of the failures? And here I see, I see Mary and Martha in this chapter. Is, now it happens as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she and her sister called Mary also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him to say, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried about and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that part which will not be taken from her. Jesus was saying here, you're both serving. That's what he was saying. You're both serving. I take from this, and I know there are many messages that I could preach on this line. Mary and Bar Martha were both givers. 
In their own way, they were both givers. One gave of her hair and that ointment and worshiped Jesus at his feet. And one gave in the kitchen. But they were both givers. And I want to focus on that idea that, that, that faith in action is exhibited here. They're exhibiting their faith. They're steering a house. They're steering their household. I'm going to show you how in just a minute and why this is so important. Because they offered him a gift. And, and, I, and, and you know, there have been times in our ministry where Amy and I have tried to teach people about tithing and giving. We've had all kinds of different experiences with that. But see, I believe that tithing and giving tends to exhibit one's faith. If I have trust in God and I believe in God and I trust that he's going to answer and supply all my needs, then I'm a giver and I'm a tither. But I, I found out, I watched my wife giving those kids quarters in the mornings and when we give them their allowances, taking out their tithes and teaching them to give. My wife has literally, is the, is the structure of my children learning to give. They're watching her. They're watching to see if she's a giver. Does she give to the poor? Does she give to other people? One of the reasons that I sow so heavily into the children in this church for years, I've done youth ministry and children's ministry, and my wife sowing into your children every single week and has for 14 years, is because I believe that God's going to use someone to sow into mine. The Bible says God's not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you miss this giving principle, if you don't teach your children to give, and years have gone by, we've gone to family after family and said, you know, your son, we noticed that your son is not tithing, and we'd like to encourage you to get them to tithe, or we'll go to the children and say, you need to tithe, and we've had parents even get mad at us. You have no right to tell my son to tithe. What I found out is most of those kids, as they get older, don't tithe. If they didn't tithe when they were children, don't give when they're little, they don't give when they're old. Because you didn't tell them how. You didn't show them how to do it. You might even be a tither, but you didn't tell them. You didn't teach them giving was important. And look at this. I want to show you something, moms. I want to show you about giving. Mary and Martha were givers. They gave of themselves. They gave of their time. They gave of resource. We can see that through what they gave. And it is interesting to me. That in just a few chapters from now, in John chapter 11, we're going to see Jesus come upon a situation involving these two women. This is not the end of these two women. We see them again when Lazarus dies. Amen. Lazarus dies, and who is it that comes to find Jesus? Mary and Martha. How can they now come to find Jesus? How do they have this re relationship? How have they opened the doors for them to speak to Jesus? How has this happened? Because they first opened the door with a gift. They opened the door in their giving. Listen to me, moms. I'm going to teach you something today. I'm going to transform your life. You've got to become tithers and givers and teachers and sowers and givers. Because it is in that giving that your child learns the humility of what God gives. You know, I found out submission has, you know, the Bible says submit yourselves therefore one to another. I want you to think about submission this way. If both of us were in a boat... And you're stronger than me. And both of us gave as much as we could. We pushed as hard as we could in the boat. Right? Then your pushing would be greater than my pushing and the boat would just go in circles. Have you ever had one arm in a boat? Have you ever, anybody ever paddled a boat, rowed a boat? Anybody? Raise your hand. You know, if you only paddle one side, you go in a circle. If you paddle the other side, you go straight ahead. But they have to be even. If it's uneven, what happens? The boat don't go straight. In submission... There, is, there are times when the stronger vessel has to give way to accommodate for the weaker vessel. Because if you didn't, the house can't steer straight or the boat won't go straight. If one wheel pulls harder than another, I don't know if you're getting a word I'm saying. But as a wife, you're considered the weaker vessel in the house, but you can determine the steering and the steerage of the house. You can determine the godliness of that house. You can determine. Young ladies, listen to me. Let's just, let's just listen to me. Just hear me out today. Hear me today. There are ladies, there are girls in this church right now sitting in this room. You came with mom today. You're living with some dude, been married two or three times. Don't point yourself out. I don't want nobody to raise their hand. And he ain't no more thought about marrying you than the man in the moon. You up in there paying all them bills taking care of all them kids, getting him tea and coffee, feeding his fat face every week, 
he ain't even got a job. And you are still in that mess? You're still up in that house letting him treat your mom that way? Because if he'll treat your mom that way, he's going to treat you that way. If he ain't taking care of you before you get married, I'm preaching real good. You ain't nothing but a slave. You selling it for free. Matter of fact, he charging you to give it. I believe we ought to tell the truth. You ought to wise up. You are, some of you are moms in this room, moms with kids. They're watching how you steal your home, steal your home. They're watching how you give and who you give to and what you do, your obedience to God. Listen to me. I'm talking about eternity. I'm talking about life existence. Listen, I tell you now, I've said this, I'm going to say it again. I mean this. Listen to me. Some of you women, listen to me. You need to give that man an ultimatum. If you treat me bad one more time, first of all, I should be gone because you treated me bad. But if I'm stupid enough to stay, I'm preaching real good this book. If you do me that way one more time, buddy, hit the road, don't come back no more, no more, no more. I don't care where you live, I don't care whether you got a meal, I don't really give a rip. Get your behind out. I'm preaching good. Don't put up with none of that junk. Wake up. You know, sometime mama right. At least 50% of the time. I thank God. I, I, I think my mama missed it with my wife because I got a great wife and I realized that and I feel like that's part of the gauntlet of getting married, you know, because my wife and my mother didn't really get along all that well. That was a, I mean, but God worked all that out. Thank God for it. I've never had any problems with Pat. She's been awesome, honestly. Truly, Pat, I honor you today. Thank you. Uh, but all them girls I dated before Amy, I'm so glad she hated all them. I am so glad she did not like those girls. She only liked them once I started dating Amy. See, that's a, no, nobody got that. But. <laughs> you don't necessarily believe mom when you're 16 or 17, and she can be dumb by the time you're 25, but by the time you're 41, you sure wish she was there to give you advice, and by the time she's gone, you wish to God you could talk to her for some answers. Why not listen to her now? And if you're the dumb bozo sitting in here mistreating some girl and you're a user, you know what? Get your act straightened out. Get out of there and treat that girl right. Have some respect for yourself and for her and stop using it. You're sitting in there living off that, taking her money, taking her money and her food. Love her enough. Don't claim you love somebody and treat them like that. Love somebody enough that you get out. <laughs> I'm talking real good. I get tired of seeing this stuff. I get, never mind. Some player. You know, got three or four women on the side, lying, cheating, stealing. That stuff ought not to happen. Somebody said, you preaching at me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm preaching right at you. And I pray to God you get it, because that ain't right. That's not right. That's not the way we act. And these women deserve love and respect. And they deserve to be honored and treated that way. Amen. Somebody smacking you around says sorry, and that's it. And you take him back every time he says sorry. What's wrong with you? Amen. 
They were both givers. They gave to Jesus, sold into Jesus, poured into him, gave and presented offerings and gifts, poured into the experience. And here Lazarus dies. Now listen to John 11. Listen to this. This is awesome. Jesus, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Why? John 11 says he loved them. Why? And when he heard, the Bible says he went and he delivered a miracle to them. Lazarus comes back from the dead. Here's my belief. Could it be? Could it be? Could it be? that they opened the doors of miracles by the gifts they presented. Could it be that Lazarus was raised from the dead because of the giving? I believe it was. Some people are just takers. All they do is take from everybody. Take, 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 take. They're always taking. Taking from somebody. Somehow taking, 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 taking. Taking somebody for something. Taking, taking, taking. Nothing but taking, taking, taking. I don't know what they're taking for. I don't know what they're going to do with all that taking, but they just take from everybody. And everybody around them is less because they're around them. Take, 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 take. Everybody has less. Everybody's less spiritually conditioned. Everybody's got emotional trauma because they're just takers. God didn't call us to be takers. He called us to be givers. And your miracle is not in taking. People that take, 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 never stop take, 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 taking. Because they're never blessed. Never, ever blessed in their life. Their life is sown into take, 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 take. Use, 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 take, 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 take. What can you give me? What can you do with me? Take, 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 take. They offer nothing. They give nothing. And for the rest of their life, they have to take. The reason there's a miracle is because they gave. They gave. And God delivered moms, dads. Listen, moms, especially in this room. Your demonstration of giving, your teaching of giving in your house will eventually become a source of deliverance in your house. If you do not give, you will not have deliverance. How do I know this? Well, we see it here. How about another scripture? First Kings. Let's look at First Kings chapter 17. The prophet has, has, Elijah has come and he has declared a famine. He's declared a drought. He had to do it by the spirit of the Lord and he declares a drought. So God's hand's involved in this. And the shelter they need, they have to get some. How do, they re, how do they sustain? How do they make it in the drought? Well, here's what it says. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord and he went and stayed at the brook Cherith which flowed by the Jordan, the ravens came and brought him meat to eat in the morning and bread in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land, and the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow, a widow there to provide for thee. Who did he provide? He didn't provide the rich dude. He didn't pro 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 provide a business. He provides what most people would cons consider to be the less or the least. A widow woman. A widow. She's obviously not a take, 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 take person. A widow. First God pointed it out because he saw it. He pointed this woman out because he saw her re reliability in giving. He pointed the blessing to her, pointed the word of God to her, pointed the man of God to her because of her propensity to give. It starts there that God sent the man of God to her because he saw her willingness and faithfulness to be a giver. First, so he gets there. So I command thee, there's a widow that's going to provide for you. So he arose to Zarephath, and when he came to the great gate city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called her and said, please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called her again and said, hey, how about bring me some bread in your hand? So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. I only have a handful of flour in a bin and a little jar of oil. 
And see, I am gathering these couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my sons. There's the giving. She's preparing for her sons and herself. She does not have a cake. All she has are the makings of a cake. Elijah said to her, don't fear, go and do as I have said, and make me a cake. Don't bring me the stuff to make a cake. Take what you have and make me a cake first. Look what happens. Don't fear, go and do as I said, make me a cake first, bring it to me. I ain't going to come get it. It's a whip with a woman. I don't know if anybody gets what I'm talking about. Think about this. I mean, that'd be like me doing that to you. Some of y'all be like, who does he think he is? <laughs> that preacher got the big head. He telling me go make him a cake. I don't even got a cake. I got to make, make you no cake. <laughs> and bring it back. You ain't got feet. Where's your legs? Come on down to my house. Y'all know I'm right. Some of you strong-willed women. Like in the hand, talk in the hand. Get your own cake. <laughs> she did though. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went and she did according to the word of Elijah, and she and her household ate many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord. Look at how giving was a provision for her family. Her giving was the provision for her salvation, for her family. God provided for them by what she did. He released blessing to her. The prophet had been the one proclaiming the drought, and they were the victims of it. But they were given an exemption from that judgment because of their giving. God exempts us from what we deserve because of our giving. Wow. That's right from heaven. That came right from heaven. God exempts us from what we deserve because of our giving. People, if you don't get the idea here, giving is a principle. And it will hedge us against lack. It fortifies us against lack and protects us in drought. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Mothers must pave the way for family success. Mothers must pave the way for family success. Mothers must train giving as a principle in their house. Who do we give to? We give to the poor. We give to the church. We give to others. We give. And perpetual blessing is an education that a mother must teach. Perpetual blessing. How do we get it? The Bible says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse and prove me now. Here with it, said the Lord of hosts. If I'll not open perpetual blessing. See, how does perpetual blessing work? Well, if I don't teach my kids to tithe, it stops with them. The window shut on them. Wow. So in order for the blessings to continue, I as a parent and a mom must add into their account of learning how to be perpetually blessed. If you have not taught your children this and they have not seen you write the check, you have failed. Your house is going to be limited. I'm preaching the word. This isn't Pastor Steve's thinking. This is the truth. And listen to me. The Bible says that he'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes. I've watched people over the years. I've watched. I've watched this. And many people who withhold financially from God, who withhold their tithes and their offerings and their giving, wives especially. And I, I, don't, I don't know why I'm, I'm using this because I'm talking to wives. But listen, listen to what I got to say here. I've watched them. And they sacrificed a light bill for cancer. 
They sacrificed a McDonald's trip for a broken down car. They sacrificed a pair of shoes for a wrecked home. So how does that happen? The Bible says he'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. If that is true, and I can open the windows of heaven by my giving, then when I don't give, I close those windows, and I don't get the devourer rebuke. I would ride a bike and walk before I didn't pay my time. Because if I don't pay my tithes, I may be riding a bike. And I might be walking. House, tornado hits, hits their house. Sickness hits their house. They're in surgery after surgery and messed up, not sick. I'd rather pay God what I owed him than be sick. Also, you have some Cheerios? Forget the Cheerios. Let me tell you something. Some of, you, some of us in this room, including me, could use to do a couple of days of fasting. See, I don't have enough money to buy groceries. Then fast. Y'all didn't get that, but. Ain't nobody in here skinny. I'm just kidding. I'd go without food. I mean, if you go without food, I'd go without food because I know if I gave God what, I, what I'm supposed to give him and I honor him first, Amen. then I am positive Amen. he'll put food. Amen. He did it for her. Amen. He did it for her. Moms, you have an obligation to make sure that your sons and your daughters and you and your husband understand that your house is steered by a principle that works within you. God shows us more women that give than any other descriptive character in the Bible. Did you know that? Let me give you another one. Let's just look at this. Let's look at another one. Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 4 runs across the Shunammite woman. The Bible shows us that he comes across her and she gives to the man of God. She sows into the man of God. Now for us that's giving into the things that God tells us to give into. She does this. God gives her a son and then sustains her son. When the enemy came and attacked the house, the man of God, because of the gift and the giving, a release of healing came to the child. God opened his hand because of her giving. Isn't that amazing? God released the hand of the man. He releases man's hand by our giving. Giving endears the heart of men. Faith and giving disarm and quench the attacks of the devil. Somebody say amen. amen. Teaching faith and demonstrating it by giving will prevent problems and incur blessing. There are people in the room, they can come drop a $5 bill in, a $10 bill. And somebody listen to me, listen to me. The principle is this. Listen to the principle. Listen to the principle, moms, dads. There are many places we could give, but obedience is better than sacrifice. Look at somebody and say, obedience, obedience. Is, better is better than sacrifice. I'm not so much about building family worship center. I mean, I would be a fool if I wasn't about building family worship center. After all, this is what God called me to do, and he called me to pastor. And pastor means to gather people for a cause, for a purpose. We're gathered, and I'm the orchestrator of that within this house. The needs of this house are very important. They're not the only needs. They're just needs. Understand. But God described to us his method of building the church. Not my method, not the church's method, but his method. Look at somebody and say, God's method. Here it is. Bring all, not the portion you didn't use on the anointed man of God on television or the other ministry that you support. He said, bring all the tithe into the storehouse and prove me with it. I would obey God first and believe for the other after it. Whatever ministry involvements there are, whatever other things you want to sow into, sow into God first. 
Do it God's way first. Give it the way God said to give it. Not $5 when you got it. He said, give to me first. There's a principle there. I want to show you one more principle, one more done. The scriptures fill Lydia and Priscilla, Phoebe, Tabitha, Ruth, Esther, Hannah, all givers, all descriptions of God and how it works. Listen to this. Just, just listen to this, ladies. Listen to this. A virtuous wife. Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She is more precious than rubies and her husband can trust her and she will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good and not harm all the days of her life. She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She's like a merchant ship that brings her food from afar. She gets up before dawn and prepares breakfast for her husband and plans the day. Notice it's for her husband. I want to make sure. Of <laughs> plans the day's work for her servant girls. She, she goes to inspect the field and buys it. This is Proverbs 31 if you didn't know. She is energetic and strong and hardworking. Look at somebody say energetic, energetic. Strong, strong, and hardworking. That means not lazy. <laughs> no discount to moms that are at home that are taking care of their kids while they're little. I get that. I understand that. Provision has to come. Mom staying home. There are moms in here that get mad at me and think that I'm saying that you should go to work. That's between you and your husband. However, if there is a way that you can do this, that you can provide for your family and increase income in your house, you ought to do it. You ought to do it. I mean, why starve them? I mean, it wouldn't be best for them to starve and do without. Right? Somebody say amen. amen. And so, I suggest to you, if, you know, in my case, I was able. I was able. This worked out for me. My wife can work here at the church. She's able to be with me here and watch our kids. This is great. If you can do that, do that. If you feel like you need to stay home and watch your kids, go ahead. Stay home and watch your kids. But realize that there's a hard work that goes along with this. The Bible says she's hard working. All right? She makes sure the dealings are profitable and the lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread. Her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. This is, this is part of the, the virtuous woman. That she extends her hands to the poor and gives to the needy. Listen, look at that. She has no fear of winter in her house for everyone has warm clothes and she makes her own bedspread. She dresses in fine linen and purple and gowns. Her husband is well known in the city gates where he sits with the other leaders. She makes belt linens and so on and so forth. Her clothes and strength so on and so forth. Charm is deceptive and beauty does not last. But a woman who fears the Lord. Okay, let's say this again. Charm is deceptive and beauty does not last. But a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. The reward of her for all she has done, let her deeds publicly be declared and praised. The last story I want to give you before I close, we need to close, is, Lydia, is, is Abigail. Does anybody in here know the story of Abigail in the Bible? Anybody know the story? Who knows the story? Just raise your hand if you know the story of Abigail. Okay. In David, when David was first uh, crowned king after, Saul, after Samuel died, he goes off into the woods and he is, he is anointed and is the leader of the Israelite people. God's called him. And uh, he goes, you know, feeling like he's protecting the people that live in the woods. He's taking care of everybody and watching out over all these people. And so he's King David, but he's not king yet because Saul's still alive. But he's been anointed king by Samuel and Samuel's going to be with the Lord. So he's, he's leading and protecting these vagabonds of people, these uh, sheep herders and various other entities to make sure that in the future they're going to be with him and so on and so forth. So as he's going through this, he decides that there's this one guy that he's married to Abigail. And uh, this guy has a whole bunch of sheep and it's time to sheep herd or, or to, sh to shear the sheep. And David says, look, I've been protecting you. I've been keeping you safe. He sends 10 men to him, says, I'm going to take... I want you to bring, give me some stuff and bless me for taking care of you, which I think is rightfully so. I mean, if you've been making sure they didn't get attacked by the enemy and destroyed, and you've been watched out over by David and his armies, why not? So he says, you give me some stuff. This guy, his name means fool in the Bible. This guy says, I ain't giving you nothing. Who do you think you are? Are you anointed? Who made you king? And David hears about this from the ten dudes. The ten guys come back and say, look, he ain't giving us nothing. He said, you're not a king, and he's, you're not anointed. 
And David says, everybody get your swords. We're going to go kill them. We're going to wipe them out. We're going to take everybody out of the family, the whole family. We're taking everybody's done. It's over, finished. <laughs> kill them. The wife hears about it. The Bible says she's beautiful. A gorgeous wife. So Bible, only the Bible says that about a couple people in the whole Bible, and she's one of them. How she is so beautiful. So she must have been a looker. Okay. Obviously, though, a lot more is going on in this lady because she's obviously wise. She's got a whole lot of, and, and obviously her fingers on the pulse because she knows what's going on. The servants come and tell her, we're in trouble. They're coming to kill us. She says to her servants, all right, here's what we're going to do. Get a bunch of meals together. Pack all the food on. They're having this feast because they're all shedding these, these sheep. And so she says, get all this stuff together. We're going to go take David a gift. We're going to go take him goods. So they load these donkeys up, load them up with goods, load them up with stuff, pack it on. And she carries this gift to David, kneels down in front of David and says, lay it on me. She says, my husband was a fool. As a matter of fact, that's what his name means, that dork. <laughs> that's what she said. She obviously realized what she was living with. You know what I'm trying to say? I mean, sometimes you got to cover for the boy. You know what I'm talking about? My wife has had to cover me with, for me more than I can count. I, I just feel like she is the saving grace of this ministry. If it wasn't for her, I'd be done. You know, she says, that dork, I mean, he's, I mean, I don't know what he's thinking, but you lay it on me, blame it on me. Here's a gift to you. I'm going to give you these provisions because this is what you asked for, and I want you to save our city. David comes to his senses and realizes, oh, wait a minute, the king doesn't kill everybody. Because of the wisdom of this woman, because she sacrifices her dignity, because she goes and takes up for her husband, and because she goes and presents a gift, giving. Her giving then changes David's heart, and he changes his mind, doesn't go and slay the people. In the end, she goes home after her husband wakes up from his drunken stupor. She says to him, I saved your life, dummy. It's really what happened. She said, I went to see David. He was going to kill us all because of you. And I gave him a bunch of gifts and he saved our life. The Bible says the man had a heart attack while she's talking to him and sits there as a stone. Ten days later, he's dead. Now, I don't know if it happened because she told him that. I don't think she slipped him a Mickey. <laughs> but God so honors this lady that the fool she's living with dies. And guess who marries her King David she offered and gave giving when she was going to die from the foolishness of her house God honored her gift and blessed her and gave her all the riches she could ever want you see moms I want to tell you something today you have power an immense power inside of you and you need to teach your home and cause your home to come in compliance with God's word, in obedience with God's word. Lead your home. Lead your home in giving. Somebody say amen. amen. Did anybody get anything out of this today? Amen.